Creek. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us here at uh, another Design for Pop virtual uh, panel discussion. Today, we're talking about architectural regeneration and how fantastic architecture can actually improve people's lives and the life of our entire community. Thanks again to our sponsors, Parkside, Strat Parkside Tiles and Strata Tiles for their continuous support. And here today we have two speakers that worked together in a, a beautiful project that I have had the pleasure and honor to visit myself uh, last summer. It, the project is called Johnstone Castle and the partnership was between Renfrewshire Council, um, represented today by Fraser Tarlin, and Anderson Bell Christie, represented by Stephen Lamb. Stephen and Lamb, they work, uh, sorry, Stephen and Fraser, <laughs> They work together in regenerating this uh, area of a town nearby that had been uh, neglected for a long time. And what they achieved together is really, really, really impressive and actually an award-winning project as well. So Fraser is the head of housing services at Refugee Council and oversees the management of some 12,000 homes as well as the delivery of the council's homelessness services and the council's Regeneration and Housing Investment Program. Fraser has worked for a number of councils across his 30-year career and has been with Renfrewshire Council since 2007. Stephen is a director at Anderson Bell Christie Architects. Stephen is a chartered architect with a very keen interest in all aspects of architecture, in particularly housing and sustainability. After working in Cullen and London, he joined the practice in 1920, 1995, sorry, Stephen, not 25. A partnership was formed in 2001 with Adam, Karen, and Bruce. In 2019, Stephen and Adam successfully restructured the practice to an employee-owned business. Stephen led the consultant team and was directly involved with the development of the Johnston Castle, the redevelopment for Renfrewshire Council. Uh, so, as usual, we are back on Zoom here, so you've got your Q&A section if you want to ask any questions to the panelists. We'll have a presentation by Fraser and Stephen first, and then any questions you will want to ask them, please uh, feel free to do so. Uh, without wasting any more of your time, Fraser, good morning. I know uh, I, you are going to introduce the talk today. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um... Can, can you hear me just now? Just wanting to make sure. Yeah, they, thanks for that. Very loud and clear, yeah. <clears throat> Good. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Fraser Carlin, Head of Housing at uh, Renfrewshire Council. And um, you know, today, the, the presentation is about Johnson Castle. John, Johnson Castle is effectively your, your typical 1950s, 60s, sort of West of Scotland council housing estate. Predominantly, you know, and you know, it's sort of you know, very much you know, a residential area, but also has a range of ancillary uses such as schools, shops, pubs, um, so you've got a good mix of outdoor and um, recreational uses as well. If anything, you could say it's you, it's effectively what would now be described as a very good 20 minute neighbourhood. Um, but in its day, um, Johnson provided sort of uh, excellent opportunities for new, new new council housing for people. But over the last 15 years, the area fell into this uh, decline. The council, we were unable to let properties in the area. We were not offering properties so over 20 times. People weren't, they weren't wanting to move into these sort of tenement properties. So in 2014, 
and that gives you a good indication of how long a regeneration project takes. It was agreed to start consulting with tenants, residents, owners in the area for a regeneration strategy. And this involved the demolition of 288 tenement flats. Uh, this then involved rehousing 194 families and replacing these with a development of 95 new built council houses across five sites. Today's seminar is, is to talk through the engagement, the design, the challenges that was followed, and it's to demonstrate the results of this process as well. And in my role as the head of housing, I was effectively the client on this project, but not necessarily the, the only, well, definitely not the person who was only engaged in that, but I'm really pleased with what's been delivered. Uh, but I don't think we would really underestimate the challenges that we faced. So that's what we want to see, and Stephen will go run through this today, is that we'll touch on challenges that we met, some of the physical challenges, some of the design challenges, but also how we sought to bring the community with us in every stage of this project and how we wanted to make sure that they saw this as being a welcome addition to the areas that they live in. So I'll pass this through to Stephen now, if that's OK. At the end of this, as Sarah said, we can answer some questions, but in the meantime, please sit back and enjoy your journey through Johnson Castle's regeneration. Stephen. Thank you, Fraser. OK, I am. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen Lamb, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Sarah, and uh, for the background, Fraser, I'm going to attempt now to share my screen and hopefully share the right uh, the right uh, uh, project. So if you give me a moment, and this time I can't find it. Um, so just put a bit pressure on. Yeah, so hope something's kicking in here. Now you have got, uh, yeah, so got a holding slide for Fraser. Um, then, uh, then there's myself. I'm just going to really talk about design development approach and met the methodology. The context is that this is an aerial shot, courtesy of uh, uh, Google. Hold on, Stephen, um, we are really still at the holding the, line. The Johnson Castle area, oh. which is this area in, in here. Our sites are identified. Stephen, Stephen we are still at the holding line. Has it moved to the... Um... Okay. It's on a context slide just now, Stephen, I don't know. Okay. All right. You yeah, it seems yeah. moving slowly, Sarah, so I'm not sure. I, I'll try switching it off and unsharing it and then sharing it again. Um, here. Sharing again. You want me to share it for you? I try it this time. Is that working now? Flicking through, can you see the aerial image? Not yet. If you could share it, Sarah. Yeah, I'll share it for you. Yeah. Right. If you're able to share it at your end, there must be an issue with my. So, yeah, if you could just go to the next slide, if you just take it to the first Google image, that would be great. That one. Next one. Next so here, one. this is an aerial uh, image, uh, courtesy of Google. Uh, the the this our sites are I don't know if you could go back the slide, please. I'll just say next when I want to move forward, Sarah. If that's okay with you. Um, yep. So this is, shows an aerial view uh, image of Johnston Castle. Uh, the, the Johnston itself is further north, and Johnston is west of, uh, of Paisley, Fraser explained in the, in the 1960s. And actually it was quite well provided for because there were schools, uh, amen local amenities, uh, but good transport link links uh, that were provided at the time. Um, but some of the housing, particularly the three, some of the three-story housing just got a bit unloved, a bit uncared for, and then started uh, becoming problematic with antisocial behavior and, and other issues start creeping in. And as Fraser explained that uh, it was decided to undertake a regeneration program. So they identified these five sites to be let as one contract um, and it was to follow a demolition contract. So some of the housing 
some of the sites wouldn't be available to start the job. So uh, one thing it did do for me is I got my step count right up at the time because we were walked around Johnston Castle uh, frequently and uh, to get to get to know the area. Go to the next slide, please, uh, Sarah. Not got it yet. Yeah, so what this identifies is two of the sites. Red line indicates the kind of frontage they're working to what we call site A and site B. This is on Elm Drive. And uh, these buildings were, uh, were going to be taken down uh, and then and rebuilt. Now, the nature of the site is we've got quite a, um, a, a narrow site and it's not very deep. So really it's kind of, the option to do anything other than replace housing in a kind of linear fashion. Site A has got the opportunity for back-to-back -back housing and um, how this the state might work. Um, but if you go to the next slide, please, Sarah, this should show kind of a close-up of the buildings. Um, they were topographic. One of the issues, one of the one of the many issues we had was actually uh, the the topography. There was quite a lot of level changes right across Elm Drive, both up the road and then uh, through the cross section of the site. Um, when the buildings were originally developed, um, sort of designed for um, uh, anybody with immunity, uh, not with uh, uh, any ability, um, mobility issues were, was not considered. So you can see on the right hand side that uh, the, the ground floors are probably about one and a half to, to 1.8 meters of the, the pavement level, which gives for anybody getting in. The front gardens you can see they are getting a bit unloved, unmanaged, uncared, and no kind of sense, uh, any kind of like positive or creative use or sense of, or, of ownership. And whilst this, these buildings will have had a history of, of joy in some cases where people, kids have been brought up and many good things have happened, I think latterly it just started sliding back into very properties, very, very difficult to, uh, to let and, uh, and to manage. So I keep, if we could move forward, please, Sarah. Done. Thank you. Uh, so the, the area is not uh, assets that's all built around this castle. So we're at Johnston Castle, a 16th century uh, uh, tower house. Um, and this is where Johnston will got its name from. And then latterly, how Johnston Castle got its name. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a very attractive single story house built in the 1960s. Um, lovely, nice garden, well looked after. And if you move into the next slide, please, Sarah we should see an example of some two-story housing and then as uh, single-story housing. Again, well-kept hedges, well looked after, quite in contrast to what we've already seen because actually within Johnston Castle, there were some great assets that had, um, if, we, if we move to the next slide, please, Sarah, I think it should show, um, the Forestry Commission have got a forest blue bell, forest that borders the back of Elm Drive, but actually it was behind a kind of three-story development. Quite difficult to penetrate that. Um, um, on the left hand side, there was one of the play areas in, in Johnston Castle. No, a wee bit sparse, a wee bit kind of unloved, but it's still on its day. Many kids would go down in there and play in there. So these are some of the assets that we wanted to try and kind of like build back into um, our, our design proposals, whatever we could. Go to the next Stephen, slide. Your, your audio is still breaking out a bit. Do you mind if I stop your video? And hopefully that will really yeah. need. Um, Please speed yeah, up that's your fine. internet. Okay, sorry. See you that's later. Fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's we can fine. still hear you. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that, everybody that's uh, with us today. Um, so, design development methodology and consultation. Consultation is a key word to this because we find that our our most successful projects with uh, working with housing associations and, and councils are those that we actually we have an active engagement with with the community. Started off with uh, presentation board and really. This is us doing a site analysis to let the community know that we understand what the assets and the key parts are uh, their community, but also to highlight what they've got. And it also then here we've identified some of the key asset uh, assets for the site with the photographs. And uh, we'll we'll run this in kind of like a, a, a drop-in session. So we might be in there at kind of three o'clock in the afternoon to seven o'clock in the evening over two nights and just encourage people to come in. And what we find quite difficult is, is our
actually getting people to actually make Kong uh, with the neighborhood, which is fine, um, but not actually what they like about the neighborhood. So a way to conquer that is actually, um, we use a kind of like a, a red and green dot strategy. So we give a real that had red and green dots and a wee sticky dots. And what we got, just got them to populate the boards with these wee green dots or red dots. So clearly green was something they liked, red was something that they maybe had a difficulty with. And what these clusters started doing was indicating to us actually what people liked. It was a very, it was very binary, but it was actually very, very effective method of communication. And everybody contributed to that. Um, and what, so using that, we like, go to the next board, please, Sarah. And what we started doing there is actually, whilst we knew we were looking at linear development, early stages, we hadn't kind of started looking at the topography yet. We did start looking at kind of fairly typical house types, two bedroom, bedrooms, two story, how they might work and what sort of um, spaces might, might get, with bedrooms, uh, how big the bedrooms might be, um, ground floor toilets, that sort of thing, to give an indication because while you were building these houses throughout kind of central belt of Scotland, um, actually when we engage a new community, they are still working with housing from the 1960s and actually they're kind of like their benchmark. So to see things with you know, housing with, with twin stairs, better kitchens, um, et cetera, um, is, uh, is, 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 is well received. We also include cottage flats. Cottage flats is a terminology that we use for um, in a two-story building, a crown floor flat, separate entrance, and an upstairs with a separate entrance. Uh, this technology works really well for elderly uh, uh, dwelling on the ground floor, access to the garden, fully accessible, and often these are used for people with mo mobility issues. If we move to the next slide, uh, we then take these house types and then them on a typical site plan um, and what this indicates here is actually how we're going to manage the ground um, so I can get car parking um, off the site and into front gardens uh, create the uh, deal with bin stores car parking bin stores are two key issues that we have to manage and deal with 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 any form of housing with social mid private re, private uh, or whatever is is their key issues about where this how we manage these things um, drying how these houses might look and even we lost and, but we what lost this the last, allowed us to do is have some sort of dialogue we lost the last 30 okay. seconds okay sorry i'm fading out here i'm not sure what you picked up what you didn't pick up but here just to quickly summarize uh, this is us now looking at the house types and um, what we've done is we put them into a, 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 a detached house a semi-detached a, a block of four how they might work how they might look Again, these are quite simplistic at the moment, large openings out the front doors. But actually, this is actually, we found this to be really good because it starts a dialogue um, with, with, um, with, our, with the, the, the residents in the, um, in, in the area, and some of which will go on to, to live in the new housing. If you want to move to the next slide. So this is the next, we did two principal consultation of rents um, prior to the planning application. Um, this is us now working up the, the proposals, identifying the sites. Um, this was us looking at, this is at the cost plan stage where uh, the council's kind of brief was to provide as many semi-detached houses as possible. So this is what this reflects. Uh, there are one or two terraces, but as we put this through the kind of like the costing process, we found that um, with inflationary budgets since 2000, this was probably about 2016, 2017, um, the kind of aspiration for uh, and the budget for, for semi-detached was beginning to get a bit more of a challenge. So we ended up actually developing this into, uh, in, into more, a more terraced form. But if we go into the next slide, uh, you can see us at a larger scale. This is us looking at site A, which is the most northern site. This again, now is beginning to look at more detail about how the sites might work. Again, this is pre-planning application. Uh, we haven't worked everything out at this stage, but we're going to indicate actually how the the, the darker green areas indicate how the sites might, um, uh, where we'd have increased slopes. We're going to indicate where there might be retaining walls. All houses would have level access. We're going to indicate actually where we might put some of the um, housing for uh, the amenity housing, 
which is the, the two houses at the top that are larger footprint uh, for people with um, that uh, require wheelchairs. Um, if we go to the next site, which is part of um, uh, adjacent to the school, I forgot to mention that, that we're right beside the school. Um, but this is where we can have a bit more interest, a bit more fun. Um, we've introduced a new road off Elm Drive that then starts creating visual and physical links to Blackmere, uh, sorry, to Bluebell Wood at the rear. It also provides another, a new access to the school car park. Um, so then what we can do is we can actually the school, which was um, had one point of entry uh, from Elm Drive, has now got two points of entry. And uh, we've got some uh, modest map for Vista parking. Um, and also there's the realigned footpath that takes access from the community, uh, the, the, the wee play area, which is down at the bottom left uh, left hand side uh, of the site right up to the, the new school and uh, the wee play area which we showed the wee photograph of before uh, we've clustered some visitor parking that provide uh, understandably visitor parking but we put a wee courtyard of parking in so that um, anybody you know that needs to drive I know we shouldn't be encouraging the car use but anybody that needs to drive from the uh, through the state to get to the parking area is able to park with comfort and 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 hopefully uh, use the, the the play area and also the play area has had some uh, reinvestment uh, since uh, during the the course of the reconstruction so which is very welcome uh, moving on to the next slide um, as part of the consultation we showed uh, images these are uh, 3d images of how the housing might sit we've overlaid them with the um with on, onto existing photographs to try and make it as realistic as possible again this is uh, well received got lots of green dots over these I regret at the time I didn't take photographs of the boards um, with green dots, but I didn't imagine that I'd be sitting here in my living room in four years time in a Teams video kind of uh, presenting this because it would have been quite valuable information. Although if I told myself to do that, I would have been wondering what Teams meeting was four years ago ever, or a Zoom <laughs> meeting as we're in today. Um, so if we move to the next slide, um, and this is now beginning to, to look at actually what, what, uh, uh, what's been left behind. I've just actually used Google Street View here to do a direct comparison. Now, uh, Google Street View, no, uh, Google Maps has got the Street View, which has got a slide over the timeline on it. And I have to admit, I had to get my teenage uh, 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 daughter to show me how to use this, but now that I know how to use it, um, it's absolutely fascinating. So we're able to take the same spot and actually sh and go back to 2000, I think this was originally 2011, uh, before we started work, which is a top slide. And then we can move down to just last summer. And it shows that, a transformation. Now, you, the, the, I would found myself just checking, is this actually the same? Because it's different on both sides of the road. And actually a, key, a couple of key things are this wee, there's a wee kind of like a box down at the bottom uh, uh, part of the corner. I'm, I'm using my mouse on top of, I realize you can't see that, which is also in the picture just at the bottom. That's it, Sarah. And you can just see it at, you just put, pops in. So it just, it does tie the two of them together. Um, but you can see here that on, on one side, unloved gardens, no sense of ownership, three stories um, high, unloved, bringing the other, the other side of the, the road down. And now actually the other side of the road is actually transformed. Now I have to say that there's some of the trees are down and the front gardens have been reworked. And one of the reasons for that is because actually for some reason when the, uh, the sites were developed uh, in the 1960s, the drainage, the principal drainage wasn't put into the roads. It was actually put into gardens. It gave us, it gave the, when I say us, it gave us a headache, but it gave the contractor a significant headache because he had to go into occupied houses, gardens, and, um, and actually form quite deep manholes. But as a result, you can see down at the bottom uh, right hand area that the, the residents benefited from, whilst they had some disruption, uh, rebuilt gardens, which was, was very welcome. So, okay, it's a kind of much more pleasant kind of uh, um, uh, outlook uh, in terms of um, the, the street. We move to the next slide, which I think is Tower Place. Again, this is just using the Google uh, Street View to just get a different, direct comparison. Uh, unfortunately, Google uh, took the photographs. The bin day was uh, the, the the recycling bins were taken out, so it should be unfortunate. However, just shows the, the buildings uh, in use. Uh, but you can see there the cars off the road, uh, lower scale. Um, and we'd like, you know, I'm sure that when we come back to revisit this uh, in, in years to come, the gardens will start getting occupied hedges will start growing, trees will start growing, because wherever we can, we've tried to, to replant trees. If we move to the next slide, these are some, we'll go into our own photographs. So this is us looking at Elm Drive. 
uh, looking over to the right across the Clyde County is behind. Um, we're using, we've designed the housing to, to step down the site to, uh, to allow us to get level access wherever we can and, and work with the, the topography. If you go to the next slide, Sarah, here you can see level access to, to all front doors. It's a basic requirement of the, the building regulations, but on sites like this, the, with the challenges of the, of the levels. So we have had to dig into the site. We had had to use uh, uh, retaining structures, but wherever we can, we've tried to model the buildings and position the buildings to make uh, best use of the top or topography. If you go to the next slide, please, Sarah. I think this will show two examples of cottage flats. I mentioned these are buildings that we often, uh, these are two story buildings with a flat on the ground floor, flat on the first floor, uh, independently accessed. Um, and often it gives us an opportunity of accessing the gable, which puts kind of active use at the end of a terrace, which, which can be quite welcome. And then the front garden you can see on the left hand side is split between uh, two parking areas. Um, so everybody gets off street parking. Again, this was quite early on. And um, so the grass hadn't fully taken and um, <coughs> there was some great feedback. It's, it's picked up in the ward, uh, happy. <coughs> Excuse me. One thing we should need uh, a, a lesson learned, which I know is, is actually go back to the community and revisit to actually find out what they think after they've been and, and what we can learn and hopefully apply to kind of future projects. But really going over some of the challenges, we had budget challenges, we had drainage challenges, topography, there was flood risk on the site. Um, we had to maintain um, access to the woodland, we had to maintain access to the school, uh, we had to follow on from a demolition program, so we were leapfrogging all over the site. Um, we had to be, and, th and that proved to be quite dynamic because the council had difficulty with vacating some of the property properties, um, so we just had to work around it. Uh, it was a one contract with a kind of phase completion, and then, you know, uh, it was actually started completing just as, as COVID started kicking in. So all sorts of issues has, has affected kind of majority of the sites throughout the country. Um, and also we had an unusual situation. We had a spring running through the site. So we had running water, which caused all sorts of problems, which had to be diverted while we, we were forming foundations and trying to divert the spring. So not without its challenges. But fairly straightforward uh, two-story house development at, on completion, uh, and it really kind of like consolidates an existing community, and uh, and I think contributes back into I think which you know, is, is, is a nice area, Johnson Castle, and hopefully we've taken away the wee bit that actually was giving difficulty, and it will now kind of this investment will give it a secure future. Over to you, Fraser. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let me see if by stopping the presentation we can see your face again. <laughs> okay. Because the audio did improve when when I've taken your video off. Let me see if I can we can see you now. Start my video, yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's see how it goes. I might need to unvideo you again because the audio definitely improved when uh, we, we when we hit the new uh, maybe I need to my broadband breaking down. Okay. Okay, let's see how it goes. I might need to hide you again. Okay. <clears throat> Fraser, sorry, over to you. Yeah, no, no, no. Thanks. That's the no, just unfortunate the, some of the, the sound issues there, but I think we, we did get the the, the the basis of the presentation. I think hopefully people were able to see the the excellent product that was delivered at the end of this. But and and I think that what you touched on that as well is some of the, the challenges and the, the actual physical difficulties that were faced through this regeneration process. I think it's, it it shows the challenges that can be faced from sort of brownfield regeneration exercises. And um, what can look as you described a fairly basic you knowledge two story residential development is actually there's a lot of work that sits behind that. Um, I think what helped from this is um, both you knowledge from from all the, the even from the contractor side, from the client side around it, from you knowledge your your own side in terms of the, the design work as well that was involved in this, as well as the engagement with the community was a very positive approach towards regeneration. I think there was a recognition that what we were long wanting to deliver here was a change to the area. Uh, and we were going to and uh, we were going to face some of these ch you know, like challenges along the way, and I think that was very good that we all engaged in addressing these challenges with a very positive approach. I, I would never underestimate the role of the community in this process as well. 
Uh, there were the, the 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 managed events that we did have, but there was also running through the whole project with things like, you know, like the, it was the, the early days almost to some extent. Facebook was kicking off, and we got a local group established who were very active in terms of sort of Facebook um, you know, Facebook conversations that were going, so that they were aware of the process. They could ask us questions around it. They were actually able to flag up some of these issues that the contractors and the designers would would need to deal with as well, and I think that was all very helpful. Uh, as on the appointment of the contractor, it was NG that, that delivered the works as well. They, they, they set a meet the contractor event up right away as well, so that they actually recognised as well, they were really imposing on these people's you know, like lives and they were imposing on how they, they lived um, and how you know, that sort of they got their kids to school, how they played and the like as well. And they built, again, a very positive relationship between a contractor and a community. Uh, they knew who, you know, if there was an issue on site, they knew who to go to as well. And I think that's very helpful. And I don't think, again, we can underestimate the importance of these relationships in a regeneration exercise. The, as I touched on at the start of the process, you know, there, was, there was a hundred, almost 190 families who were affected from this. 190 families were living within these three-storey blocks. 95 have come back and, and, know, and they are very happy and they know that, they know that there are some you know, that there are some teething issues and sort of um, as, as they move into new houses. But the feedback we're getting is people are very happy with the homes that they've got. Some of the owners uh, moved um, and they know and they have moved on to different areas within you know, within Renfrewshire and beyond. Others um, we dealt with them through an you know, exchange of their properties and they have been rehoused in Renfrewshire. And again, they feel as if there has been a positive benefit from this regeneration process. So I think um, the lessons that we get as a client around this is regeneration takes time. And if you don't give it time, you won't do it successfully. You have to have a very much a design-led approach where, you, where, you, where you've got an ambition of what you want to deliver on sites and that you're willing to commit the time to it, you're willing to commit the resources to it, that you, you, know, you recognise that you're going to have an excellent product at, at the end of it. I think, and I will be biased to say this, is we do have an excellent product at the end of it. And this has been shown by the, the national awards that we've actually achieved in this area. And that in itself is a good recognition and something for the community to be proud of. They actually see that area being spoken about at a national level now, as opposed to previously, it was a kind of byword for an area that, it was an area that was in decline. Uh, the area has turned now. Um, and that's what I think in terms of the, with the delivery of well-designed houses, we are starting to change this community and we'll continue to change it. So thanks for, not for Stephen's involvement. And I think it's a thanks to every you know, that sort of contractor that was involved. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're happy to, to answer questions on this if, if, if people have them. So pass back to yourself, Sarah. Well, uh, this this benefit to the community, obviously I'm a local, so I can I can touch firsthand the benefits. And I remember the area used to be felt very unsafe and very neglected, yeah. and now it's absolutely beautiful and it's a very desirable place to live. But do we have a tangible way to measure the benefit? Uh, like, I don't know, they had the existing houses were there. I'm sure they've gone up in value considerably yeah. compared to before or the re re retention of tenants. Num yeah. uh, do we have any numbers? Yeah, no, 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 not numbers specifically to hand. What I can tell you in terms of anecdotal information, certainly there has been an increase in house values around this area. Uh, there's also an increasing demand that we, as, as I mentioned previously, we were offering properties, you no. Know, 20 times people would just weren't looking to, to move into this area at all. Uh, we now have a you know, we now have a waiting list for property in Johnson Castle. We are actually building new houses, you know, another say half a mile away from this site as well, uh, where we've already got a waiting list waiting to move into this area. It's kick-started a regeneration exercise. There's another area that's it's Howwood Road, which is you know, quite close to this area as well. And it's kick-started a regeneration exercise there. Uh, where the community has been recognised for a number of years, one that just doesn't engage. They don't talk to, you know, to, to, to public agencies. Uh, they very much kept themselves to themselves. What we're finding now, because of the experience here in Johnson Castle and something that we're doing across other communities in Remshire, is by building up that trust, then communities are willing to, they, they, they recognise that you're coming in and you're actually wanting to work with them. They're wanting to listen, they're listening to them, they're listening to their, their views in terms of how the housing should look, how it should operate, the types of housing that they need for their families, that what they want in their area. So we're, it's very much we're seeing a tangible benefit here uh, from you know, what is a physical design process. I would also, you know, taking it back a wee bit further on this, is that there was actually you know, a charrette that was carried out in Johnson Southwest 
It was around 2009. Uh, I think it was the Scottish government's first charrette that we were involved with. And at that stage, we, we had the we had public, private sector, community involved in that you know, that sort of operation as well. At that stage, the private sector. Where, where they were at the meetings. I remember the chief planner for Scotland was actually at one of the meetings with Jim McKinnon at the time. And he got very strong message from the private sector is that no private development would ever take part in that community. It was, it was referred to as a, a kind of tertiary economy and that the private sector would not be interested in building in this area. We now have planning applications that are coming forward for varied, you know, the Don homes, Persimmon homes, uh, the Stuart Milne homes that have been looking to build in this area within the last five years. That, to me, I see is, is, a, is, a, is a sign of success. It's a sign that people are wanting to move into that area. Uh, and I think, again, it's a, it's a credit to the community that they had to live with the, the inconvenience of this construction work. But again, we've got a product at the end of it. It's a community that is regenerating and improving. Um, and that, that, to me, is a, is a, is a great outcome. Well, it's a credit to your vision as much as anything else, um, because obviously your, your offices and Anderson Bell and Christie started the whole idea. So that's off to you. Uh, the other key element, I think, is we obviously you said both in the presentation and in your own introduction, we went from a high number of plants to a much less number of units available. So what is the fine balance between density and economics? Obviously, the higher the density, the cheaper it is to build them. But then you decided actually to go against that. You you decided to go for quality more than density. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd let like Stephen come in on the detail, but probably from my side, and I, I think we, we, we saw this as being a, it was, a, it was a family neighbourhood. I think we would look at that and know that this, this wasn't a town centre location. It was very much as a an, an area that has those school recreational assets. To here. But it's an area where people should and do want to bring up their children. So I think it was. Um, I think that was where the drive towards the two story houses, front and back doors, would come from as well. The designs itself as well. You know, it's one of the issues that we wanted very early on was things like kitchens that would have access for a table where kids could do the homework. Sounds really simplistic, but it's a really big outcome to get when you actually see the homes when when they they, they act as family homes. They don't have wee, you know, like, um, kitchens that are you know, like, that don't work. Um, so to some extent, I think it's, we felt as if it was the right mix for that community. And Stephen, we, we slightly touched the importance of outdoor spaces. You mentioned there was a play park over there and then uh, you, you've done a lot of studying about back gardens and, and front gardens and trees and everything. How much do you think the outdoor spaces will help the community in develop further? I, well, I think, I suppose it's, it's a general thing for, for any uh, area that's got outdoor space got that uh, link with the community. It, it helps foster community connections because if you've got a play area, kids congregate, people get to know, I hope my area, it allows parents to get together with their children. You find the children about the same age, they're at the school, it gives you not, and we found when we brought our, our kids up, play areas where we've got to know people. Outside the schools where we got to know people and, and developing communities starts actually with connections with people. So if you've got good outdoor spaces, whether it's play areas, a walk through the wood, whether you're a dog walker or just walking through, I find that, you know, one of the benefits over the last two years of COVID is I walk more, I walk more in my local area. And I find it quite difficult if I've seen the same person three or four times in the park not to acknowledge them. It becomes kind of like quite difficult not to acknowledge. And then that's what starts breaking things down in time. or what I say, allows communication. And, and uh, you kind of, so you, you start meeting people, you start, and it, it's all the basis of a community. If you can run events, if you've got like, they, they do have a community facility, which was well used at the time. And I'm sure that, you know, this, this extra investment in here with these new people coming in will kind of inv invigorate all these. So there was a lot of good things in Johnson Castle. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's really encouraging to hear what Fraser was saying that, you know, that if, if private developer through Charette was saying basically, this area is not right for private development. And then with some careful intervention and taking away the bits that were giving the challenging, giving the challenging behavior, the challenging lets, et cetera, and taking those out and actually having the brave investment decision saying, we're not going back to three story, we'll do it in two story and we'll do it well, then actually turns the area around. So it's actually that small invest, amount of investment in a, you know, maybe what we're maybe talking about between five to 10% of the, of the footprint of Johnson Castle actually turns the area around. 
and suddenly people want to come back in again. It's all good for the community. And it's, you know, it's great for the folk who are there that have had to endure kind of like any antisocial behavior or any difficulty with, with the housing that was there before. Um, but also, you know, I, we, we talked about this before that, you know, that that three story housing wasn't all bad all of the time. There was when it was built, it was very much cherished and loved. People moved in because they were living out, coming came out of some very difficult circumstances. But just as things evolved, and you know, you know, we all know about how it's, what's happened, kind of like when you put one social group that may be in difficulty, financial difficulty, into into one building, how things can deteriorate. So, yeah, but I think to answer your question, it's a long way of saying it, but to answer your question, these social spaces are vital for community development. And just to, unless there is other questions from the uh, audience that uh, I uh, see if there is any question coming from, from the audience, but I'll probably just time to wrap up. So last thoughts on this beautiful project. Um, Stephen, how much did you enjoy it? <laughs> how much did you hate it? Because I'm sure between drainage and split levels and slopes and stuff like that, it's been a very difficult project, especially because it was such an extended area. And as you sa said, you couldn't start from A and go down to D. You had to jump frog from one side to the other. How much of it did you act, did you enjoy it? And what are the lessons learned that you want to carry on to the next project with you? Well, I think with um, any project that you get kind of get ups and downs where kind of things sometimes kind of get, you know, it's not quite working out. You get difficulty with, you know, getting approvals in place in time, et cetera. Because sometimes I think one of the frustrating things for, for us as consultant is that we're, um, you know, we, we try to get other things like approvals, planning approvals, building works, which out with our control within and manage that within a time scale. That, that sometimes brings a challenge and it brings pressure or whatever. However, there's many points of kind of like where you just remind yourself about why you used to do architecture. And whilst this is not like the top end of art, this won't win kind of like a civic trust award, but actually, that doesn't matter because actually it's transformed people's lives. And that's what's more important actually but with some of these projects. And, and when you go to a community consultation event and you go in and you realize what folk have lived with and what you can work with them and their enthusiasm for looking forward, you do leave these meetings right, about what you do and what you're contributing. And then when you go through the process and you work with the contractor and you know sometimes it can be a bit kind of like, uh, you know, the contractor's trying to, you know, you know, there can be, it's, it's not always a pleasant situation getting things built, but you know, there's moments where you see buildings coming out the ground and you see the roofs going onto it and folk are smiling about where we are and you see the first houses handed over and the clients go in and, you know, there's part of, um, you know, Sir Fraser's team, Martin, Jennifer, Leslie, you know, we got such great feedback, feedback because, you know, what I think what Leslie said is she told me once, she says, you make our job easier by what you do. Do you know? And, it, you know, Leslie was great to work with. So was Martin, so was Jennifer, you know, so you do, you, you work and you get this kind of like window of working with a team. And then just with the way the procurement works, you don't always get the best, the opportunity to kind of go on and build from that. So I think lessons learned are, you know, community, always involve the community and, and try and work as po positively as you, as, as you can. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Fraser, how, how well do you think Anderson Bell and Christie implemented your brief and your vision? Oh, no, I, 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 without complaint, no, I can't only really sort of criticise and can only really sort of praise um, the, the, their implementation of the project. Um, I think the fact, you know, and the, you know, Stephen mentioned there in terms of officers within the sort of the, the housing and within the council that they work very closely with and I, the fact that they still have a very positive relationship with them. Um, I, I really welcome this sort of the praise that he's given you know, to, to Leslie, Jennifer and Martin on this one as well. As usual, in terms of being the, the, the sort of boss, I, I, I come in and do these sort of things and take all the praise at the end of it, but they did all the work. Um, mm -hmm. And actually the fact that they, you know, were, 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 they are still very well recognised and appreciated within the community as well. I think that's really important. They've saw the fruits of all the labour on this. I must have to you know, like praise Anderson Bell Christie's process in this as well, as long with the, as long with a range of other professionals and officers and elected members as well. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of you know, as your question to Stephen, you know, did you enjoy it? You, you you don't work for the council to enjoy anything. Unfortunately, I think if you, you know it's um, you go through a process, but actually you do enjoy what comes at the end of it. And I think that's what the, the fact <laughs> that we had that the brief to work to, um, and we had something that we we all. We're bought into as well, along with the community and the fact that we can now actually see what's come out of the ground. It's it's a great it's a great product and a great result. 
Well, congratulations again for such a beautiful regeneration of a very deprived area. And thank you very much to both. Uh, sorry we couldn't see your face, Stephen, but at least the audio was better. Uh, yeah. Thank you for all your time. Uh, and then again, if you've got any questions to ask to our speakers, please drop us an email. We'll pass them on. Uh, the recording of the webinar will be available on our YouTube channel uh, very shortly. So thank you again, everybody, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.